Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the mother and Sri to all of you from Sri Ashram Delhi branch. Today we shall uh, talk about uh, the way the muscles move. We have already seen how the muscles uh, work, but then uh, the muscle being able to contract with the help of a message coming from the spinal cord is not all that there is about it. Uh, there is a lot more that goes into the way we actually use our muscles. And uh, just to sort of give a little basic idea, I'll first go to the whiteboard and then we switch over to the PowerPoint. By now you are all very familiar with this diagram, this cross-section of the spinal cord. And within that... Uh, the gray matter here, and in the gray matter, one category of cells, nerve cells, supplies the skeletal muscles. This, of course, is something which is fundamental and uh, also absolutely essential. If there's any damage to this nerve anywhere, or this nerve cell, this muscle is completely paralyzed. It becomes completely lax. It just cannot contract. But then, uh, apart from this, there has to be a lot more because uh, how will this nerve cell know when to contract, when not, sort of when to fire, when not to fire, and uh, uh, what should happen to the other muscles which are related to this? Uh, for example, this muscle has an antagonistic muscle, the way, you know, biceps. Uh, and triceps, they're antagonistic. So when the biceps contracts, the triceps should relax. Then only the action of the biceps will be possible. So uh, how does the, that come about? And uh, then we can move this muscle as and when we wish, which means that they should have some connection with the areas uh, which channelize our wish to do something. So uh, all that does not happen in the spinal cord. The spinal cord can has only reflex mechanisms, that is involuntary mechanisms, which are not under the control of our willpower, which means that there has to be a lot more that has to go into this. And uh, we shall see uh, today what uh, all that is. And in fact, that can be pretty complex because uh, Now here is the spinal cord and this nerve cell which represents those all those cells which supply skeletal muscles and uh, to make sure that the antagonistic muscle relaxes this can give a branch here which uh, You know, filling in this means that it's an inhibitory neuron and this inhibitory neuron then goes to the antagonistic muscle and uh, then you have uh, the area of the brain which deals with willpower, the cerebral cortex. There has to be a connection between this and this neuron and uh, so on. And uh, then, you know, this movement uh, also has to be related to the sensory inputs uh, because uh, uh, we take, uh, we decide to move uh, the muscle sometimes in response to a sensory stimulus. For example, an animal, when it finds food, it wants to uh, go towards the food. So it is the, which means that this should be, uh, there should be a connection between this and also the cells, also those nerve cells. Uh, which make it possible for us to see. And uh, uh, then, you know, there is an emotional response. For example, suppose uh, uh, when I see a beautiful flower and uh, one decides to pluck that flower. Now, the decision is a voluntary action, but then that has been engineered by a, an emotional response. So it means the areas we deal with emotions should also be connected to this. And uh, while I'm in these actions are voluntary, uh, there are uh, many of these actions which are not so voluntary. Uh, 
we have got habituated to them. For example, cycling, swimming, and uh, uh, so on. So we have learned them. To start with, they were voluntary, but now they become more or less involuntary. So for that, there has to be another mechanism, which means that uh, there has to be another area which deals with this type of functions, and that somehow has to get also connected to, th to this mechanism of contracting the muscle, which means that uh, there is a large uh, amount of regulation involved here in the control of this uh, nerve cell, which uh, eventually leads to contraction or relaxation of a muscle. So with this uh, little background, let's now switch to the PowerPoint. Let me start with a quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, the physician who practiced in the Boston area in the 19th century, but warmed with that unchanging flame, behold the outward moving frame. Its living marbles jointed strong with glistening band and silvery throng and linked to reason's guiding reins by myriad in trembling chains, each graven with the threaded zone with, which claims it as the master's own. But warmed with that unchanging flame, this seemingly refers to the blood. The... Uh, Pajani, sir, sorry to interrupt you. I'm not able to see your slide now. If you're sharing it, I'm not seeing it. Okay. I'll share once more. Church. Sure. Can you see it now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So this is the... Uh, these are the verses that I was reading from Oliver Wendell Holmes, but warmed with that unchanging flame, this seemingly refers to the blood. Blood is warm and uh, it's an unchanging flame. You know, there are homeostatic mechanisms which uh, maintain a certain constancy in uh, the uh, composition of blood in terms of nutrition, not uh, letting waste products accumulate, the acidity, the saltiness, so all that remains unchanging. So warmed with this flame, flame in the sense that this is what makes uh, the activity of uh, any part of the body, including muscles possible. Behold the outward moving frame. Now, the frame, that is the bodily frame, just see how it moves. It's living marbles jointed strong. Living marbles here refers to the bones and they are joined uh, to one another. And that's what makes movement possible at the basic level. Uh, it's living marbles jointed strong with glistening band and silvery throng. Glistening bands and silvery throng, referring to the tendons and uh, the ligaments and so on, with glistening band and silvery throng and linked to reasons guiding reins. And these muscles are under the control of willpower and therefore they're linked to reasons guiding reins. That is that control which comes from that part of the uh, brain, which deals with reasoning, that is the cerebral cortex. So it's only when it's linked to that, that we are able to use our willpower to move the muscles and link to reasons guiding reins by myriad in trembling chains. So what is it that links uh, these muscles, these moving parts of the body, the muscles and the bones and the joints, what is it that uh, links uh, these to our willpower or our capacity to reason by myriad, that very large number of trembling chains. Now, these are the nerve fibers. Uh, these nerve fibers are in a very large number, so myriad in trembling chains because uh, they work by passage of electrical impulses. So that can be sort of considered a sort of a trembling of these nerve fibers, each graven with the threaded zone, which claims it as the master's own. So each nerve fiber on each nerve fiber is engraved a message. And uh, each nerve fiber considers that message as the master's own, that this is the person to whom this body belongs, to whom I belong, and this is what the master has willed. And uh, each thinks that, yes, I'm the one who's carrying the message, which is the master's own. So beautiful way of sort of looking at it, that you are the master, you've decided to do something, and uh, then in these trembling chains carry that message to those parts of the body which move. And uh, here he has talked mainly about the bones and the muscles and the tendons and so on, uh, which uh, together move the outward, which move the frame, 
the outward visible frame of the person. So, but warmed with that unchanging flame, behold the outward moving frame, its living marbles jointed strong with glistening band and silvery throng and linked to reason's guiding reins by myriad in trembling chains, each graven with the threaded zone which claims it as the master's own. Now, uh, we just saw that uh, uh, there's a whole chain of uh, structures from where influences impinge on the spinal cord, that set of neurons, which we call the alpha motor neurons in the spinal cord, which supply the muscle. That is the final common pathway. Of all the influences that impinge on the muscles, the messages finally converge on those cells in the spinal cord, which supply the muscle. So that is the final common pathway. But there's a large number of those influences impinging. And in a way, there is a sort of a hierarchy the, uh, of those influences. So those influences come to the spinal cord uh, from uh, the brainstem, which is this part, the thalamus and the pons and so on. And uh, the, this is the thalamus here and the cerebral cortex, that is that part which deals with the conscious activities with thinking and reasoning and so on. But then one thing which has not yet been shown here is the emotional part of the brain, uh, which also has an influence on this and uh, the sensory cortex and so on. So all that together, uh, all that is integrated together and that is what finally uh, leads to a certain type of influence on certain muscles in the, the muscles through the cells in the spinal cord which supply those muscles. But then don't forget two more structures, the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, which also have an important role, although they are not uh, fitting into this hierarchy, but then they also have a very important role to play. So all these, uh, these are some of the major participants which determine what will happen in the spinal cord. Now, the muscles, even when we are not contracting them, are in a state of partial contraction all the time. And uh, that is what we call muscle tone. And uh, that's why we find that uh, during yogic practices, say in Shavasana, when we make a voluntary effort to relax the muscles completely, we can relax them further. And uh, here is the electromyographic evidence of that. This shows the muscle activity. Uh, so you find that uh, as the muscle contracts more strongly, this activity gets bigger. There's more electrical activity, but even at rest, when the person is apparently doing nothing with the muscles from where this recording is being made, still there is some activity. And this is because there is a muscle tone, which means that uh, the partial or weak contraction is always there. And uh, it's in a practice like Shavasana or any other relaxation practice of this type where one can make a willful effort to totally relax those muscles. And then we find that this activity disappears. The EMG or the electromyographic activity becomes totally silent. Now, this helps us in uh, uh, answering this question. Why does a person with arterial blockage in the legs eventually develop pain in the legs even at rest? Uh, we are more familiar with the arterial blockage in the, those arteries which supply the heart, the coronary arteries. But this is a generalized process. Arterial blockage is a generalized process and can affect other parts of the body also. And uh, in some individuals, it affects the, uh, to a large extent the arteries which supply blood to the legs, the leg muscles. And uh, one can understand that if this blood supply is compromised when the person is walking or uh, running, uh, the, because of this blockage, the supply will not be able to keep pace with the requirements and the person will have pain while walking or running. But then as this disease progresses, the person also starts having uh, pain even at rest. Now, when the muscles are not being used, the person is totally at rest, lying down. Why is there pain in the legs? That happens because uh, the muscles are still in a state of partial contraction all the time and therefore they do need some minimum amount of energy uh, not only to stay alive, 
but also to maintain this minimal contraction, the tone, which is always there. And uh, this type of blockade, predominantly in the legs, takes place particularly in smokers. The disease is called Burgess disease. And uh, uh, now there is some treatment possible through surgery, but uh, there was a time when there was no really real treatment possible and the person finally went on to a stage where the blood supply was so compromised that uh, the, uh, that the, the tissues in the leg started dying and a dying tissue uh, attracts germs. It uh, starts putrefying, it starts, uh, it develops an infection and uh, then that leads to what's called gangrene. And from there, then the infection can spread through the whole body, through the bloodstream. And uh, that is a serious situation because it can lead to a failure of multiple organs wherever this infection reaches and the person would eventually die uh, after getting gangrene, uh, death is pretty close. And therefore, what was done uh, when uh, surgical treatment of this type of arterial blockages was uh, uh, not possible, what was done was that before a person reaches that stage, if there's a gangrene, then uh, pretty soon before there's a spread all over the body, the leg was amputated. So the person lost the leg because of this arterial blockage. And uh, while I'm in now some surgical treatment is possible, still the best would be that uh, the person does not smoke. So a person with arterial blockage in the legs eventually develops pain in the legs even at rest because even at rest, some contraction is present and this is what we call the muscle tone. Now, while the nerve supply to the muscles comes from the spinal cord, that is the final com common pathway, the reflexes that uh, make these muscles contract may originate in the skin. For example, if there's a painful stimulus applied to the skin, the person, say, finger uh, uh, touches a pin, a sharp pointed pin, then the reflex is that the hand would be withdrawn from there as a result of contraction of a certain set of muscles. But the reflex may also originate in the muscle itself. When a muscle is stretched, it contracts. So that is also a reflex. So stretching of the muscle itself leads to a contraction. And this we use when we are, say, lifting a weight. Suppose you have to lift a suitcase. First, we just apply a little uh, force there without actually lifting the suitcase. So when we do that, the muscle gets stretched and that leads to a contraction. And that helps us in continuing the contraction further, building up more tension as we lift the suitcase. And when the tension reaches a level where it is a little more than the weight of the suitcase, the suitcase starts moving up. So a stretching of a muscle leads to a reflex contraction of the muscle. This is what we call the stretch reflex. But then corresponding to this, there's also a reflex which originates when the tendons are stretched. Now, when a tendon is stretched, just the opposite happens, the muscle relaxes. Now, why is this there? Because when a muscle contracts, a tendon is also likely to be stretched. And uh, when the tendon is stretched, the muscle actually relaxes. This would make the, firstly, the contraction of the muscle leading to a movement more smooth. Because if there's also a little break applied simultaneously, then the movement becomes more smooth. But more important than that, the fact that when a tendon is stretched, the muscle relaxes, ensures that the muscle will not contract so much. The muscle will not have so much tension because of the stretch that it uh, gets an injury. So this is a protective response. The stretching of the tendons actually relaxes the muscle. And this is something one can use in practice. Say if a person's muscle goes into a spasm, and uh, this may happen quite commonly to this muscle at the back of the leg. This fat muscle at the back of the leg that is in the calf, the fat calf muscle, the gastrocnemius muscle. Suppose this goes into a spasm, and as a result, the person gets pain. This can happen uh, as a result of exposure to cold, particularly at night. Uh, so if the person's leg has been exposed to a little cold at night and this muscle has gone to a spasm and the person notes in the morning that this muscle is paining, then, of course, applying a little warmth will reverse the situation. But before that, some instant relief can come by pulling on this tendon. 
So instead of trying to pull on the muscle or massage the muscle, what one can do is to pull on this tendon. You know, this has a long tendon which goes right up to the heel. The, now this tendon, uh, which is very prominent, goes right up to the heel. If you pull that, you'll find that pulling that tendon a bit will relax the muscle and sometimes the spasm goes away immediately. There will be an immediate relief of the pain. So this has an application also. The stretching of the muscle leads to a contraction, whereas stretching the tendon leads to relaxation. Now let's go straight away up to the cerebral cortex. Now over there, you have directly concerned with the, the movement, a large number of areas. And uh, this is the central sulcus, that is the groove in the center, more or less in the center of the cerebral cortex. And uh, this is in front of it. This is the primary motor cortex. But then there are supplementary motor areas here and here. And uh, this is the post-central gyrus uh, which is uh, the sensory cortex. This we had seen that that is behind the uh, central sulcus. And uh, why all these areas are involved in movement, one can understand. Uh, suppose I see a flower. I say, what a pretty flower. And uh, then I say, I want it. And therefore, I should pluck it. Now, why these question marks here? These question marks indicate that black box about which science doesn't understand much. Uh, the stimulus is uh, stimulates the light receptors in the eye and the, all the pathway involved in taking it right up to the that area of the brain which uh, uh, is associated with seeing things. It's at the back of the cerebral cortex here. Uh, this area is activated and then the stimulation of some association areas finally makes us realize that it is a flower. And, uh, but while all this is a physicochemical process, these nerve impulses going up and uh, activating this part of the brain, it's a physicochemical process. My feeling that I've seen a flower and that I like it very much is a subjective experience. So how is this physical chemical activity translated into a non-material subjective experience? This we do not understand. And then this decision that I want the flower and therefore I want to pluck it is also a subjective decision. It's subjective in nature. And it leads to this objective change in the brain. Uh, we can monitor the electrical activity here. When the person decides I want it, this is the area of the brain in front of the central sulcus, that is the primary motor area, that gets activated. Now, how is it that this subjective decision of uh, plucking the flower translates into this physicochemical change in this part of the brain, which initiates this nerve activity so that it is finally conveyed to this neuron in the uh, anterior column, uh, the alpha motor neuron, this set of motor neurons which supply the muscles. Uh, how is it that it translates into this? So from here onwards, it's all a physical chemical process, but it's uh, an objective process which can be measured, but this was something subjective which could not be measured. So what is it that links this subjective process to this uh, physical chemical change? We do not really understand. Now coming to these multiple areas and uh, talking about three basic things. When... Uh, we decide, and the cerebral cortex is the area where we decide things. That is the part that deals with conscious activity. Consciously perceiving something or consciously deciding to do something. So this is the part that deals with that. Now, this is the part that gets activated when we have decided to approach a certain target, to move our body towards a certain target. So first is the target identification. For example, in this case, the target was the flower. So first thing is the target identification. 
Then the next is uh, planning and action. That is, what is the set of muscles that should work so that I can move towards this goal? So there has to be a planning required because a large number of muscles will have to contract and some others relax to make the body move. So a coordinated activity of a large number of muscles, some of which will contract and some of which will relax, will actually enable me to approach this goal. And that has to be planned somewhere. And then finally, there should be an area to execute, that is, which uh, sends appropriate impulses to those muscles which have to contract. And uh, this is how the movement will be executed. And uh, corresponding to that, we have these three different areas. Here is the area uh, which is uh, for target identification. And uh, this is the area where action is planned. And this one in front of the central sulcus, that is central groove, immediately in front of it is the area which executes. This is the area from which those nerve cells, it, which has those nerve cells, which go all the way up to the muscles. So it's a very long nerve fiber starting from here and going all the way up to the final common pathway that is uh, the cells in the spinal cord which supply the muscles which have to contract. But then on the way, there will be other influences and other interactions which will modify this message and also uh, make it more uh, smooth and coordinated. So this shows you in a colorful sort of picture, the precentral gyrus. Uh, this is uh, the central sulcus, and this is in front of its precentral. Here, you know, the brain has been kept uh, the other way as compared to here. Here, the back side was on this side, and the front was on this side. And therefore, the front, that is the precentral, in front of the center was on this side. Here, it is on this side because the brain is being looked at from the other side. And you can see on the back side, uh, this cauliflower-like structure, the cerebellum, which also is very important in uh, uh, regulating the muscles, we shall see in a moment. So this is uh, the primary motor area in front of this central groove. And uh, once again, as in case of the sensory uh, area, there is a representation of the body here, which means stimulation, if we electrically stimulate, as uh, Penfield, the neurosurgeon did. If uh, we stimulate a certain part of this, then it's a specific part of the body that moves, which means that there's a representation of the whole body in this area. And uh, as in the case of uh, the sensory cortex, here also, uh, the right side is represented on the left side and the left on the right side. And secondly, the representation is upside down feet up and head down. So this is the motor homunculus. So feet over here and uh, the face over here. And as in the case of the sensory cortex, here also the area dedicated to a particular part depends upon how fine the movements there are. So the fingers, particularly the thumb, which are capable of very fine movement, they get a very large representation, whereas uh, the feet and the legs get much less and then the face where delicate movements of muscles which uh, lead to our expression you know which reflect what is going on in the mind through the contraction and relaxation of a large number of muscles in the face uh, those muscles get a much better representation the eye movements are also very fine they get a go good representation so the representation in the uh, primary motor area uh, depends upon uh, the uh, how fine the movements are in that part of the body. Further, all motor areas which we talked about, the one concerned with uh, the target identification, the one concerned with the planning, and the one concerned with actual execution, they are naturally interconnected with one another. They are also interconnected with the sensory areas because uh, it is uh, on the basis of sensory information that we often decide to 
move our muscles in a certain way, like so seeing the flower and deciding to pluck it. So seeing is a sensory function and with regions concerned with emotions. I like the flower, I love it. And uh, therefore uh, that again uh, is an emotional response and that has to be communicated to the motor areas, to the areas which deal with controlling the voluntary muscles. So they're interconnected. In fact, as we go along, you'll see that almost every part of the brain is interconnected with every other part. And it's the richness of these connections that ensures coordinated activity of the nervous system. So we have seen the hierarchy uh, from the cerebral cortex downwards up to the spinal cord. And it may now appear that, well, the story is over because we decide to pluck something, we decide to do something, we decide to walk somewhere, we and uh, we decide to lift something up, and uh, we find that uh, the uh, that's possible through the circuitry that we have discussed. But uh, that is still not over. There is still a lot more uh, to it, which is necessary. And uh, Uh, what we will now see is what is that the cerebellum does and what is it that the basal ganglia do. So first the cerebellum, uh, which is uh, towards the backside, uh, seemingly separate but connected with the rest of the brain, this cauliflower-like structure, the cerebellum. Let's see what that does and how that contributes to the muscle activity. Firstly, the cerebellum helps in... Uh, 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 it, uh, giving us balance in a particular posture. And uh, in a way, the most difficult posture is the standing posture because uh, such a, on a, such a small base, we stand erect. And uh, the cerebellum, along with the eyes, helps us regulating it. And of course, the visual information is also uh, interconnected with the cerebellum. But cerebellum on its own, also because of its connections with uh, the sensory information coming from the muscles and joints and from the ears, you know, ears also have a part, the vestibule, which uh, is concerned with detecting all types of movements, linear acceleration, rotatory ex ex movement, and so on. So all that information is collected by the cerebellum and it can put it together, integrate it, and help us achieve a certain equilibrium. Now, here you can see uh, Harshita, she is... Uh, we are doing uh, what's called an ankle stretch breathing. That is standing on the toes and stretching her whole body, taking the hands up. Now, this is a posture in which uh, our ability to uh, find balance in a posture is being challenged. It's just the toes on which she's standing completely erect. And therefore, when we start this posture, the instructions given are keep the eyes open because the cerebellum plus the eyes, both are important. All the visual information, because visual information going, visual information going to the cerebellum also helps the cerebellum do this. And uh, uh, a young, healthy person like her may be able to close the eyes and still do it, because uh, uh, the cerebellum is also getting inputs from the muscles and joints and from the ears, etc. And therefore, the person can do it with the eyes uh, closed also. But it does help if the eyes are also open. And uh, that's why the person is told to keep the eyes open and to fix the gaze at, the, at a point immediately in front of her. And uh, then it becomes very easy to be able to do it. Uh, the difference becomes obvious if a person has a disease affecting the cerebellum. Such a person using only visual information also may be able to do it. But if you ask this person to close the eyes, then the person starts swaying and may fall because uh, the person was depending purely on the visual information for maintaining this type of a posture. The second thing that the cerebellum does is to coordinate the activity of different uh, muscles involved in an action. And uh, uh, this becomes uh, obvious, again, if a person has uh, a disease of the cerebellum, then we find that the uh, person's movements are not well coordinated. and uh, to compensate for this lack of coordination, the person may walk on uh, a broad sort of uh, support, which means the person tends to keep his feet a little wide apart 
while walking. One very important thing which enables the cerebellum to perform this function of coordination is comparison. Comparison of what? Comparison of the intentions, the intention of the cerebral cortex that this is the type of movement that is wanted. And therefore, these muscles should contract to this extent. So that is the intention. But then that intention is being fulfilled by a certain contraction which is taking place in steps gradually. It's a process. And therefore, at each step in that process, some of that intention has been fulfilled. So what the cerebellum does is to compare the achievement or accomplishment, that is the extent to which the movement has already taken place with the intention. So how much has been already accomplished and how much still remains? The two are compared. So this comparison between the intention of the person and the actual accomplishment uh, is used by the cerebellum to slow down the activity of certain muscles, to initiate the activity of a new set of muscles, and so on. So it is this comparison. And you can also see that this comparison will, be, will yield different results during this entire process, because we are not talking of a stationary situation. We are talking of a dynamic situation where the movement is taking place, which means that from moment to moment, the gap between the intention and the actual accomplishment will keep changing. So the cerebellum takes into account this changing situation and uh, it's uh, as, a, as it takes care of this changing situation, uh, the, uh, the instructions going from the cerebellum keep changing. And uh, that's what leads to fine coordination. And uh, this is often tested uh, clinically by doing what is called a finger nose test. That is, you ask the person to take the finger towards the nose. So you ask the person to take the finger towards the nose and uh, it's normally very easy. A normal person can do it also with the eyes closed. because the cerebellum alone is enough to guide us. But then if you pass this person who has a cerebellar problem, even with the eyes open, what he does is, when he is about to reach the nose, you know, he finds it difficult to reach the nose. So this is the finger nose test. This is where we were. So the comparison. So you can see the importance of uh, comparing this. Yet another thing that the cerebellum does is to spare the cerebral cortex from routine activity. Because then the cerebral cortex can uh, use this, its capacities for more creative, innovative, new types of things. Uh, uh, and this comes in, you know, say if, when a child learns walking, initially the child has to apply all its attention uh, to the act of walking and still the child stumbles and falls. But the once the, somebody has learned walking, then without thinking, the person can just go on walking and doing anything else. So the person can walk and talk, the person can do just about anything while walking. And uh, what we learn a little later in life are things like uh, say swimming or cycling. Now, those are things also which initially start a conscious activity. We have to put all our mind into that activity, do it willfully, to be able to do it even reasonably well. And after some time, we find we are able to actually do it much better without even thinking about it. And that is because then the cerebellum takes over completely, which means that the cerebellum is not only, uh, is not a static structure, it is capable of learning. So while we are learning, the cerebellum is also learning something. And finally, it's in a position to take over that activity completely so that the cerebral cortex is spared from that. We don't have to willfully uh, uh, to try and swim or cycle or walk, the cerebellum can do it without our using our willpower. Now, what about the basal ganglia? Another structure involved here. Now, basal ganglia are not seen in this because they are deep under the cerebral cortex and uh, it is uh, these are the basal ganglia. They have a few different parts with different names, but uh, you don't have to bother about that. These are all basal ganglia. And uh, 
they are deep within and they are in terms of evolution the precursor of the cerebral cortex which came later on now what the basal ganglia do is to make possible movements by internal cues and one a good example is uh, when we are happy or when we are sad then those internal cues from the body make a certain set of muscles in the face contract and relax and the result is that our face itself gives away what is going on within you know we can make out from the person's face uh, that the person has a long face today the person is not feeling well or the person is radiating joy so those movements of those muscles those fine movements of the facial muscles are a result of those internal cues and corresponding to this therefore if a person has a disease of the basal ganglia we find that that expression is gone the person's face looks exactly the same all the time like that of a mask the mask doesn't change any expression it is a fixed expression so that's why we say that the person has a basal ganglia has a mask like face another important function associated with the basal ganglia is geographical memory we go to a certain place and somehow we remember what how to go there again now this geog geogra geographical memory varies a lot from individual to individual and therefore some people say that my sense of geography is very poor even if i have been to a place 10 times still i forget uh, how i went there and somebody has to guide me i have to use say the gps again to be able to get there properly or i have to ask somebody and interestingly most people who take to driving naturally have a very good geographical memory and therefore once they have gone to some place even after years they remember exactly how they reached there uh, among the animals one set of animals which are a wonderful geographical memory are the birds migratory birds travel very long distances uh, without uh, losing their way and that's because they have an inbuilt good geographical memory and uh, is corresponding to this we have very large basal ganglia proportional to the size of their brain their basal ganglia of these birds which fly long distances are very big when a person has uh, a disease of the basal ganglia that a degeneration of the basal ganglia uh, which may be age related and the person gets what's called parkinson's disease it's called parkinson's disease because uh, this was described for the first time on the basis of observations of a few of his patients by dr james parkinson a british physician uh, who described this in the year 1817 in a long series of essays on the shaking palsy as he called it and this is the first page of the first chapter uh, in which he says involuntary uh, tremulous motions with lessened muscular power in parts not in action and even when supported with a, a, a propensity to bend the trunk forwards and to pass from a walking to a running pace the senses and intellect being uninjured so this is sort of an introduction summing up the type of symptoms that he had observed in these patients now let's have a look at some of these symptoms uh, properly this parkinson's disease and uh, you can see this person is bent forwards and as he walks he walks in small rapid steps and because of these rapid steps it seems as if the person is running rather than walking so running comes more natural to this person small rapid steps and being bent forward it seems as if the person is all the time trying to catch his center of gravity and then tremors at rest this person has tremors of the muscles at rest uh but then when the person actually starts making a movement uh, to do something the tremor disappears in contrast in case of the cerebellum there are no tremors at rest but when the person tries to approach a particular target then when the person is near that target then the tremors start then the person starts so that's the difference between these two types of tremors in the muscles here the person has tremors at rest and the cause of this parkinson's disease is degeneration of those uh, pathways in the basal ganglia which employ dopamine as a neurotransmitter they convey messages to from one neuron to the next from nerves one nerve cell to the next using this chemical called dopamine 
and when this pathway degenerates the person gets parkinson's disease and the treatment is to give a substance very similar to dopamine l dopa so this is going to the root of the problem in a way and therefore this has helped a lot in the treatment of parkinson's disease so we can see that uh, being able to move about normally is uh, itself a blessing and uh, we should never forget that how complicated the whole process is and uh, if you are able to do it properly you should always thank the divine for that blessing the anatomical pictures in this presentation were mostly taken from Tortora and Grabowski's Principles of Anatomy and Physiology. Gratitude to the Mother in Shurabindo for uh, making these sessions possible. And thank you all for being there.